I'm just taking the pleasure uh, to introduce um, Ellie Dürring, who is a, um, a, a long-standing associate of the European Graduate School, um, a, a very uh, um, say invaluable, um, beloved member of our faculty. Um, Ellie is uh, known for his work in, in history of science and philosophy of science. He is um, he normally teaches in these subjects with us, uh, with authors such as Einstein and Bergson. And uh, he has been a, a regular participant in our science colloquia, which has been a, a great pleasure. Tonight, he's going to, uh, or tonight, his time, he's going to be um, speaking about uh, or, or working with a novel he has, um, he has written, as you've seen in the publicity, um, uh, devoted to uh, um, uh, Glenn Gould. <laughs> so um, it is, it's, it, it's quite a departure. Maybe Ellie will say two words about what has happened that he's moved into fiction <laughs> this way. Um, is this, should this be disconcerting or um, I, I, I see it rather as, uh, I'm inclined to see it rather as just a, a sign of this expansiveness, this cross-disciplinary expansiveness and then an adventurousness that, that um, is characteristic of Ellie and we, we value so much. I want to, before I pass the screen to Ellie, um, I, I want to announce, um, well, two things. First of all, I, I believe uh, Nemanja has already indicated that if you have questions for Ellie, which he will be happy to entertain, I think, uh, please put them in the Q&A box so that um, he will be able to review these easily. Okay. Um, and then the second thing that I want to mention is that we will have another EGS event, online event, in just four days, which is, is going to be rather special, uh, uh, I, I believe, and I want to be sure that everyone knows about this. It is a, a colloquium organized around the work of Svetan Ugrizit, who is, uh, who is actually um, he's an exiled theorist and writer, exiled from Serbia. And we will have a, a panel of uh, individuals, very uh, accomplished and knowledgeable individuals talking about his work, about the meaning of, of what has happened to him uh, with regard to contemporary democratic um, functioning. And so I th and this is something I'm, I'm really very, very happy that the EGS is able to do. And we're, we're actually welcoming back Svetan in this uh, context, who has done some beautiful work, um, wonderful work. So this will be uh, on the 8th, and I do want to note for those of you who are, who are accustomed to our lectures, that this will be taking place two hours earlier than um, at our normal time. So um, the, the, uh, the time in Paris when this takes place will be at 6 p.m. So in uh, um, Eastern Standard Time in the U.S., that will be uh, 12 o'clock. So uh, please um, make a note there. I think this is going to be um, special. And with that, uh, let me then uh, pass the screen, as I said, to uh, Ellie. Um, and I'm very eager to, to hear what, what follows. Um, thank you very much, Ellie. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. And also thanks to Dr. Mitrovic Nemanja, who helped putting th this together at a time, yes, 8 p.m. 8 p.m. my time in Paris, which is not um, an entirely natural time to, to have a lecture on a Friday evening. But then again, we've seen weirder things lately. And, um, and I thank you all for giving me the opportunity to present, yes, and to elaborate a little bit on a recent book co-produced, I might say, with artist Alain Bublex. So, where is it? Yes, here's the book. And I'll say a few things about the book, but the best thing, of course, is to read it if you do read French, because the book was written in French. Uh, it came out uh, about a month ago and um, it is presented as a fiction, yes, um, an illustrated novella as it is. And I would like first to give you some context about this publication because it matters and kind of already answers uh, Chris's query about how come that I, I abruptly turned towards fiction which is a genre which I, I never really seriously considered before. So when the publishing branch of um, the Paris Philharmonic asked me to contribute to a new series they were launching, a series of uh, narrativized and illustrated monographs on great performers and composers, I immediately thought of picking up from where I had left things 20 years ago, 
uh, after spending some time, that was in two, year 2000, on a paper dealing with Glenn Gould and John Cage. That was more of an academic paper, if you like. It appeared in a, at the time in a, in a special issue of the French Review Critique. Um, and it was a kind of a, an attempt at, at um, providing a philosophical framework to compare John Cage and Glenn Gould, whose practices, musical ideas, in a way stand on the opposite sides of the spectrum. But I tried to show that there were interesting intersections. So I thought, why not pick up things th where, where I had left them and elaborate a new those strange ideas in a fictional form. And as a matter of fact, it turned out to be the ideal homework, the kind of homework I was expecting to deal with the second lockdown in, in, in France that was uh, last autumn. Um, not only because it was a fun thing to do and to you know uh, spend time with, including, of course, the ongoing back and forth with the artist, and the ensuring uh, daydreaming, if you like, inspired by all the visual and textual material documenting the Canadian urban landscapes and all that. I'll come back to it. So not because the sheer pleasure of the sheer pleasure of, uh, of, uh, of um, confronting myself with all these images and discourses, but also because I soon realized that the the fiction that was gradually taking shape on that basis was, in fact, a fiction about creative confinement. So the performative situation I, I put myself in was, in fact, the very same that Glenn Gould, in a different context and era, was dealing, has, had been dealing with his entire life. Creative confinement, I don't want to use the word lockdown. I can't think of anything better than confinement. In French, it sounds okay. Confinement is, is a mild way of saying that you're uh, isolated, insulated. And that's the way I want to take it here. I want to take it as a, as a positive and potentially creative mode of existence that, in fact, Glenn Gould tried to elaborate for himself in many ways. So the fiction is really about that. And, of course, it chimed very naturally with a situation I was, I was myself um, confronted with, uh, with many others at the time. Um, Glenn Gould's fascination for the theme of solitude and also uh, its counterpart, action at a distance, tele-action. Um, his intensive practice of the recording studio, as well as his taste for long road trips by car, and of course his celebration of the deserted, frozen landscapes of northern Canada, all this seemed to point in the same direction, and in fact that my uh, my uh, own situation uh, in in a sense now the question for me as a as a tentative novelist was this how was i going to deal with this without in fact writing another narrative essay on the virtues of retirement and more generally speaking on gould's ideas about isolation as a necessary condition of uh, of creation uh, how how to avoid the uh, the es the essay disguised as a as a as a novel or a fiction uh, because the essay in fact was already written it was available out there at least for uh, for people reading french and i don't didn't want to simply um, uh, perform it in a narrative uh, way so how how to deal with this predicament um, in fact, the, the idea of fully embracing the fictional form also um, had its uh, own uh, dangers. I mean, uh, it implied for me avoiding an even more obvious pitfall, uh, namely that of contributing to the persistent and somewhat uh, fetishistic Gould mania by providing, in the end, a more or less playful, more or less entertaining staging of the infamous biographical anecdotes that illustrate Gould's legendary extravagances, his eccentricities, his mannerisms, and so on and so forth. So uh, the, 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 the trap of being overly theoretical under the disguise of fiction 
and the trap of fictionalizing in order eventually to contribute um, uh, even more to the ongoing ghoul mania, these were two symmetrical uh, traps I needed to avoid. Um, so I just referred to the mannerisms, to eccentricities. I'm not sure how much every everyone here is familiar with uh, Glenn Gould's life and the, the legend that comes with it. But, I mean, you can Google it for yourself if you're not really familiar with it. You can picture Gould. Um, it's been widely uh, illustrated and, and, and commented upon. Gould wearing his uh, coat, his beret, muffler and gloves. Uh, Remember him soaking his arms and hands in hot water before engaging in day-long recording sessions at the CBS studio in New York. Gould at the keyboard, and I'm kind of mimicking him here, <laughs> sitting on my chair at my desk. Gould at the keyboard, singing along with the piano. He liked to describe his hummings and gruntings as vocal elaborations, which is a nice way to put it. Gould hovering low, very, very low over the keys with eyes closed, seemingly entranced. Gould seated again, low, much too low, in his overused bridge chair with the piano raised on wooden blocks. Sometimes laying back, crossing his feet, his left leg over his right leg. And I could go on and on, assembling such iconic intimations of Gould's... Um, uh, of Gould's uh, persona in a more or less rhapsodic fashion. So I'll stop here. Uh, but I'll add a few more thoughts, though. I mean, we've all heard, uh, because it connects with the book uh, somewhat more directly, we've all heard also about Gould's slightly neurotic and hypochondriac habits, his obsessive concern for the ideal bodily posture. Let me sit back on my chair. It's been documented in a 200 pages long personal diary elaborating at length on the appropriate sensory motor and kinet kinetic exercises that may address Gould's lingering shoulder and back pain issues. It's quite an interesting read. I've, I've been through it in order to elaborate the material for my fiction. And um, I think most of my fiction is, is directly derived from that very um, um, I mean, uh, arid and, 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 and somewhat uh, repetitive um, uh, uh, elaboration of Gould on his own, uh, on his own uh, 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 physical uh, uh, condition. So more importantly, however, and focusing back on Gould's actual contribution to the history of musical performance. I mean, he's, he's one of the great figures in the history of musical performance. I want to say a few things, add a few more touches. We're all familiar with the notoriously unpredictable character of his delivery of some of the great classics of classical and contemporary music, from Byrd and Gibbons, uh, Handel and Bach, down to Beethoven, Beethoven, sorry, Schoenberg, Webern, and Hindemith. And what I should uh, remind you, what distinguishes Gould, um, Gould's interpretations, um, is, well, first of all, the somewhat idiosyncratic choice, uh, and this is the most obvious uh, thing that people bear in mind, probably, um, his idiosyncratic choice of extreme tempi, tempos, disregarding the conventional, traditional ways, the insertion of uh, somewhat disconcerting slow-mo effects in the delivery of certain main themes in a sonata, the hammering out of bass lines, very heavy and, and present, uh, his obtuse refraining from using the sustaining pedal where it should be used, his quirky arpeggios, his Finally, his weirdly detached ornamentation and articu articulation style, the so-called staccato style. I'll have to come back to this because I, don't, I think it's a misnomer, which gives, yes, gives the impression of dissecting the melodic phrases to bring out their crystalline contrapuntal texture as if seen through X-rays, so to speak. Adorno used that uh, analogy in a, in a piece about uh, 
um, contemporary music where Glenn Gould is, is touched upon. And Edward Said in his musical elaborations, there's a very nice piece about Gould in, in that book, also uh, highlights this kind of X-ray quality of, of his interpretations. Um, why am I reminding you of all that? Because um, it's a very important uh, uh, characteristic of, of Gould's um, uh, philosophy of music or, or, or musical practice as it is, that performing a piece for him means above all reconceiving the entire musical structure down to the backbone uh, in order to bring out what, in his view, constitutes the essence of musical form, namely its, its structure. So basically, for him, it meant creating the piece anew through all the various uh, devices and, and tricks I've enumerated in, in random fashion. Uh, they all converge in a single aim, which was to uh, provide not so much a unique gold uh, rendering or performance of the piece, but the piece itself, whether Bach's or Beethoven's, the piece itself, the idea of the piece, only as revealed and staged by Gould. Um, that was his, uh, his uh, view of performance. And of course, that's where the analogy with filmmaking comes in. I'll elaborate a bit later on that. Um, and, and I just want to give you the, the main idea. The idea is that the score, which is supposed to encapsulate the structure of the piece, the score is in fact somewhat like a script, like a movie script. That can be modified as, as one is shooting. Uh, a, material, if, a material, if you like, that eventually will be thoroughly edited in the studio by cutting, splicing and so on uh, to actually bring out the, the form that it hides the ideal form that it hides. So for me, this analogy with filmmaking provided a cue for the way I had to address the, the issue of writing a fiction about Gould's musical ideas and not so much about Gould's personality or eccentricities. I'll come back to that in a, in a moment. But you see, the method of creative interpretation favored by Gould uh, was in a way my lead constituted my lead and it couldn't be otherwise um, so that method of creative interpretation of course um, produced uh, not so much mixed result but let's say controversial to say the least results when Mozart for example was submitted to such treatment uh, by Gould um, he seemed to have lost most of his courtly quality in the process his, his nice gallant quality if you like um, he came out as dynamic and straightforward, somewhat joyous in his own way, but stripped from all the lyrical atmosphere that stems from his most famous pieces. Um, so it was not Mozart anymore, it was something else altogether. On the other hand, many would agree that Bach's fugue, for example, his fugues and sonata, were in fact sublimated and that Somehow the listener had the, the sense of reaching, um, uh, being, uh, being granted access to recesses of Bach's genius that had not been disclosed in, in that way, in that, with such a degree of, 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 uh, of, uh, uh, of effectiveness by previous performers. Um, but this implied, of course, um, a somewhat playful uh, debauchery of tricks and devices and 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 and, and techniques which uh, Gould himself well, it's not clear whether Gould himself took them very seriously or whether he conceived of them as part of a unified method or a general strategy uh, before recording the slow movement of Bach's G minor concerto Gould told Andrew Kasdin who at the time was his producer I quote, I'm going to play all sorts of inner voices and syncopations, very Wanda Landowska with a touch of modern jazz quartet. So don't be surprised at what you hear. And that was part of a recording session. I'm not sure how much of this is retained in the final editing, but it gives you an idea of the playfulness that came with this general 
seemingly general method of in creative interpretation. And of course, not everyone was favorably surprised or impressed. Horowitz, uh, for example, after listening to Gould's piano recording of Wagner, allegedly said, he played like a stupid ass. Okay. Uh, I've heard such comments myself. So some of my good friends are melomaniacs. Not many of them like Gould, but as expected, the harshest critics among them happen to be ex-Gould buffs. They used to revere the Goldberg variations, but hear him, hearing him perform and ridicule Mozart, um, stripping off all the grace, was to, to them a, a total turnoff. Um, so I had serious and intense conversation about that, that aspect of the Gould effect. Um, so back to the fiction. My point, of course, was not to offer a vindication or a celebration of Gould's uh, method or musical heritage. I do not think I have added much to the ongoing Gould mania and the very intense academic activity surrounding uh, Gould. Um, by reminding the reader a few real, literal anecdotes that Gould himself has talked and written about extensively, uh, my ambition was not to provide anything new. Uh, and the same goes for his uh, musical ideas. I just staged them in a way that I would say um, uh, makes or makes certain connections more obvious. That's a very minimal agenda that I, I had for a while was to just to m draw some connections and make them appear in a conspicuous way. Um, throwing a, a different light and uh, on, the, on the matter and, and maybe uh, allowing certain reliefs to appear more clearly. So, speaking of uh, images, um, if there were but one image to retain from the Ghoul mythology, all this material, which I, I, uh, I went through again 20 years after the fact, with great pleasure. If there were but one image to retain, it would be the following. And I want to start with that. So let me quote here for a while. Uh, it's a quote from a filmed interview given by Gould in 1960. It's called On the Record. You can find it online. I think uh, YouTube has a version of it. Um, this, is how, um, this is how Gould speaks. I remember, he writes, when I was a kid, I always associated the New York Philharmonic broadcasts, which we used to hear on Sunday afternoons, with great vast fields of snow, white and grey. We used to go up we used to go up north to the country for weekends, and about four o'clock in the afternoon, I, I guess it was already quite dark by then in in Canada, uh, about four o'clock in the afternoon, the Philharmonic would be on when we were on our way back to Toronto. And in winter time, it was usually gray, a sort of endless vista of snow, frozen lake, frozen lake, horizon, this sort of thing. And Beethoven never sounded so good. So this is the image. Um, it's an anecdote which uh, provided me with a seminal intuition, the guiding thread, if you like, for setting the general atmosphere of my narrative. And it's not only a matter of setting the mood, uh, the atmosphere. It's also a way of having all the various lines converge, uh, crystallize in a single image, a moment, a capsule of, uh, of, 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 uh, of, of, uh, of memory, which uh, if I had to give it a title, would of course be called the idea of North. The idea of North is as you may know, the title of one of Gould's radio documentaries on the experience of isolation. He called it a dream documentary. Uh, it comes, it presents itself as a, a, a radio montage, a contrapuntal allegory, if you like, of, of human isolation and solitude, combining the voices of different characters, people living in the outposts or settlements of northern Canada. And I guess Gould's intention was to describe or to give voice, literally give voice to a lifestyle that in his view offered in a paradoxical way a, an alternative to the spiritual void 
of modern urban society. Okay, uh, so that's uh, for the, the, document, the radio documentary, but of course the idea of North is an expression that keeps recurring in his, his interviews, his writings. You may know that uh, his writings, I'm not talking about the interviews, the actual writings fill a, some, something like a 600 pages book Tim Page is an essential Glenn Gould reader. He was a prolific writer. So in his writings, you'll find the expression idea of North or no, the North as an idea uh, recur uh, in, in very different contexts. And uh, of course, it has um, a, a deeper and, and, and perhaps more diffuse meaning in Gould's life and work than what that particular radio piece may suggest. Sometimes it crystallizes in musical rem remembrances of Gould's uh, childhood or teenage years, as we have just seen, the frozen lake, uh, the frozen lakes, the horizon, this vista of endless snow and so on. And of course, the music of Beethoven. Sometimes it uh, directly connects with the, uh, what Gould describes as the luminous ecstatic clarity of Bach's musical structures or for that matter, to the cold and somewhat dry and uncompromising quality of certain uh, compositions by Sibelius or Hindemith. So the idea of North runs deep and, and, and diffuses in very different strands of, of Gould's uh, imagine, imagination, if you like. And um, uh, of course, every each time uh, in, in connection with a particular projection of what he takes to be the essential condition of creation, namely confinement, isolation, solitude of a particular type. Now, in order to put the image to work, the, the, the one I, I, I quoted, and in order to allow it to uh, open up um, and diffuse through my narrative, without turning my own narrative into a mood piece in turn, I felt it was necessary to add another ingredient. So um, uh, the point was to articulate this image with something different, something at, at a different level, a motive, if you like, that uh, was more conceptual in nature. I started to reflect upon a few paradoxes that Gould specialists have often underlined and which for me was the necessary ingredient to uh, counterbalance the immersive and immediately pleasing and almost entrancing uh, idea of North, uh, immersion in the, in, in the idea of North. I needed some kind of conceptual antidote, some kind of conceptual uh, counter effect in order to um, uh, achieve something on, uh, on a narrative level. Um, so I'm going to present a paradox, which I think is the central paradox of uh, Gould's creative uh, method, the creative um, method I, I alluded to earlier, which of course involves, essentially involves considering performance as a creative act or interpretation, musical interpretation as a genuinely creative act. There is a paradox there, um, and this is not something new, I'm not making it up, or it's, it's been highlighted in different ways by many commentators. But I think it's nicely summed up in a, in a remark um, by Gould about um, a colleague of his, as it is, Schnabel, Arthur Schnabel, the pianist. He said about Schnabel, he, Schnabel, seemed to be a person who didn't really care very much about the piano as an instrument. The piano was a means to an end. Um, and of course, the, the formula, I believe, applies to Gould even more. Gould would claim, typically, that Bach's musical structures are not inherently attached to any particular instrument. Certainly not the piano, which of, of course Bach could not have known in its modern form uh, in his lifetime, but not the organ, not the harpsichord either, which is a more controversial claim. Ideally, Gould thought that one would need to play the piano as if it were a harpsichord, as if it were an organ, or a Moog synthesizer, for that matter. You may know that Gould was a big fan of Walter 
slash Wendy Carlos, uh, the musician who recorded Switched on Bach, among others. And the point is that Bach, according to Gould, sounds even better if his musical IGs are freed from what he referred to as the nauseating pianistic ideas inspired by the Romantic or Expressionist tradition. So his, his habit is to call Romantic anything that uh, uh, remotely uh, conjures up this, this no nauseating pianistic tactile comprom uh, uh, compromissions, which he, he thought that uh, uh, great composers such as Bach needed to be freed from. Um, how does this connect with the image? Well, very simply, listening to Beethoven on the radio in a car during a car trip performs, fulfills exactly the same function in its own way. It's a, a way of stripping the musical, the concert performance, as it is, a concerto in, in that case, from the oral and oratic uh, resonance that it naturally has in the archetypal musical experience of the concert hall. Listening to that music um, somewhat uh, submerged or, or, or immersed in the, in the roar of the, the, the motor car, uh, the, the bumps of the road and the ongoing conversation of the parents is the ideal way of listening to Beethoven. Uh, this is, of course, uh, far-fetched and I'm trying to make a point, but Gould uh, very naturally made that point in, in those precise words. You know, Beethoven never sounded so good. That's how the quote ends. So this paradox, this general paradox, illustrated in my sense by the very image uh, that I took as my, as my lead, this paradox, I would call it the paradox of uh, instrumental indifference. I say paradox now. Why is it a paradox? I say paradox because in order to implement this principle of musical indifference, one is forced, well, Gould felt he was obliged to delve deep into the actual mechanisms of musical performance, which is counterintuitive. You might say you, you only have to retire from the concert setting from, and, 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 and free yourself from the musical compromissions um, uh, 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 of the instrument in order to raise to the ideal mute form of the work. But that's not how it works. It's not a purely mental operation. In order to achieve uh, uh, what, what Gould has in mind, you need, as he did, as he constantly did, to confront yourself in a specific way with the material and m almost mechanical underpinnings of musical performance. And that's where the paradox lies. It's the paradox of, a, of, of, of what I may call the pragmatics, the pragmatics of ecstasy. What the ecstatic and ultimately idealistic approach favored by Gould um, um, requires is in fact a, a heightened, um, a, an, an, an intensified attention to the material and pragmatic conditions of musical performance. By the way, ecstasy, in, in Gould's parlance, he often uses the phrase ecstasy, it does not, of course, refer to a romantic uh, inclination for boundless horizons or a tendency to yield to moments of uh, oceanic uh, immersion or connection with the infinite. Ecstasy is a technical matter. Ecstasy is a matter of technical transcendence, if you like. It involves a systematic overturning of the inherent practical or instrumental limitations of the musical settings. But in order to achieve this, one needs to become an expert. One needs to develop a heightened sense of the technical um, cogs and wheels of musical performance and the particular assemblage, assemblage I don't know how to pronounce assemblage, in, in, I guess it's not, a, uh, it's not a Saxon word. The assemblage that is required to allow the form to be revealed beyond all those limitations. Okay, so this pragmatics of ecstasy, I, I take it, is, is conjoined, constantly conjoined in Gould's actual practice with an idealistic uh, stance 
that strongly resonates with Hans Lick's formalist uh, theory about uh, pure musical form. And this uh, combination, of course, is rather in unstable uh, and produces, uh, in turn, yet other paradoxes. I, I, I will have to uh, skip that, uh, but uh, we could go further down in the analysis of the implications uh, of this uh, unstable, again, conjoining of idealism and pragmatism, if you like, if you want to sum it up that way. But uh, simply to illustrate that general point, I'll give you one quick example among many I could provide on different levels. I mean, from pianistic finger technique to structural principles of interpretation. One single example that has to do with the actual mechanics of the piano. That's why I think it's, 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 it's interesting to consider. Um, uh, sometime near the end of uh, his concert career, Gould had his favorite piano, his favorite grand piano as it is, customized or re-customized. So the mechanical adjustments brought to the Steinway D30, uh, D318 or CD318 included, among other things, some fine tuning to confer a harpsichordistic, Gould would say, feel to the piano. So he wanted to push the sine wave a little further down the road of the harpsichord. Not too much, just to feel, a touch of harpsichord. Then the hammers, in order, I guess, to achieve this, the hammers had to be moved closer to the strings to get a more immediate bite, a somewhat lighter, more nervous uh, and responsive tactile uh, reaction. Gould also required minimal key dip with as little aftertouch as possible. So the idea was to achieve a quasi-immediate and total damping of the note, a kind of tap. Um, I, so I could go on and on. There were other details involved, but uh, this is typical Gould. So instrumental indifference, but in order to achieve this, you have to tune your piano to customize it in a very peculiar way in order to bring it in, in a relation of proximity to another instrument. Um, in order to be able to exploit, to mobilize the kind of differential between piano and harpsichord, you need to uh, turn your piano into a monster of sorts. So that is what, I could have used other examples, but that is the kind of thing that is required uh, by Gould's uh, general method. That is what it takes not to care much about the piano as an instrument. I'm quoting uh, again from Gould, uh, remark, Gould's remark about Schnabel. Uh, now, briefly, still, uh, as, as concerns the, the relation of musical interpretation, not to the instrument, but to the original score, which I take to be a, an extension of the instrument, in a sense. Uh, it's, it's part of the general organon of the musician. It's part of the, it's an extension, it's an essential one, of course, because it gives a blueprint for the interpretation, as opposed to the piano, which indifferently can be put to work to, for many uh, compositions and pieces. So the, the, the score has, a, of course, a central function, but it is the way Gould approaches it. It is yet another cog, or maybe an essential wheel in the assemblage. And, um, and of course, the method he advocated uh, as I uh, alluded to earlier, was to treat the score as a film script or a basic scenario, a uh, basic plot, if you like, um, that had to be studied with great scrutiny, but in order to turn it into something else. So, for example, another reference to one of his colleagues, if Stokowski was an ecstatic in Gould's ca categorization, he, he was part of the good guys, an ecstatic. It is, Gould argues, because he was involved with the notes, of course, um, with the tempo marks and, and, and every detail of the score in order to transcend them, just as a filmmaker is, of course, up to a point involved with the, the original source or book or script, which supplies the impetus for his work, but in order to transcend it and eventually to uh, bring it to a d different level, another level, through the process of editing and montage that is implied by a recording. Um, and the essential point here is that the filmmaker is not bound to follow the original, the script, in every detail, 
But in order to realize this, he needs to spend years working on that scenario, just like, like Stanley Kubrick did, working with his scenarist and, and, and dialogue makers uh, in order to eventually produce something that uh, everybody was uh, uh, felt uh, was a betrayal of the original idea or the original work. Um, all right, back to my own process of narrativizing. As far as I, I was concerned, these considerations regarding Gould's method and the paradox of instrumental indifference naturally hinted at the appropriate way to devise a narrative about Glenn Gould's musical ideas. Again, that was the aim. The narrative would have to proceed like a movie that is loosely based on scripted elements of biography that I had to ingest and digest, um, but in order to turn them into something else. So what I did very quickly is trade the piano and the whole atmosphere of, of this concert hall and the studio for a different but equally familiar setting, for Gould at least, the car. Uh, I thought the ideal form would be a narrative that is that would be the equivalent of a road movie. And in order to achieve this, I had to place Gould, place back, back uh, place Gould back into his car in one of his favorite models, the Lincoln Continental, Continental that I gather he purchased around 1967, 19, 1977. It's pictured. Um, um, in 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 the in the in the film 32 short films about about Glenn Gould and it's also present in let me share my screen for a while in the book that is the result of my narrative um, musings um, Alain Bublex the artist I worked with did a nice job uh, let me share the screen um not illustrating the images and anecdotes and bits of biographical content that i introduced in the narrative he did much more than illustrated he actually provided the the the, the impulse and the intuitions for many of the scenes i have staged um so uh for example i was referring to gould's car here it appears on the right that is the setting in which the narrative takes place almost entirely. Um, of course, this implied for me a good deal of research uh, about Gould's favorite cars, the successive Lincoln models. There were several of them that he acquired over the years. And so I decided uh, to stage a road trip um, to put a long story of a not so long story. It's a 60 pages book full full of illustrations feel uh, um, so it's not it's not a it's, it's not even a novella it's like more of a, uh, a narrative uh, strip um, so to make it short nevertheless um, the story if, if there is a storyline and I guess there is one is um, a road trip back from a catastrophic concert performance to Toronto. So back to uh, to um, uh, to Gould's native town, Toronto. What is the point of, of staging this road trip in, in this linear fashion? Well, simply to elucidate further the paradox I just mentioned. My hunch was that focusing on Gould's fondness for car driving would shed indirect light on the general paradox, but also to an event which is directly connected with this paradox, um, a central event, a, a pivotal event in the pianist's career, namely, and I haven't yet alluded to that, namely his much publicized and dramatized retirement from concert performance in 1964 at age 32 or something, Gould gave his last concert Right, so this is something something almost uh, Christic about his this uh, this uh, disappearing act at a very young age, and um, and it's of course very much part of uh, Gould's legend. Um, 
I don't have to uh, expand on that. Gould had always, had always, even before that, all, had always been fairly critical of the ritual of the concert. So he hated the kind of uh, macho atmosphere where the listener secretly hopes for the for the wrong move, um, uh, for the the catastrophe to happen at at some point during the concert. Um, and so he expatiated upon this this theme uh, at length. Uh, for me, of course, this uh, central event, this foundational event in his in in, in the arc, the arch of his uh, of his life, his biographical trajectory, could not be avoided. It had to find a place, um, and it was only natural for me to provide my narrative with the fictional va vanishing point of that last concert. I say fictional because, of course, the way I introduce it is entirely fictionalized. I set the event of the last concert in a virtual city called Gluskap. The city was designed by Alain Bublex, my uh, fellow artist, as part of uh, an ongoing project. Uh, Gluskap, if you if you like to know, is, is a city, a virtual city located in New Brunswick, Canada, in the vicinity of St. Andrews, in fact, at the very location of St. Andrews. And it has taken shape over the years by way of an accumulation of visual elements. Let me share again my screen um, uh, here. Yes, uh, you have a glimpse. It's a it's the artist's own website of the wealth of documents, pictorial, photographic, cartographic um, elements and uh, material that he has gathered over the years and in the context of several exhibits uh, around the world, documenting and in fact giving shape, literally uh, literally uh, uh, producing, giving almost uh, spatial temporal existence to a fiction, an entirely fictional city of northern Canada. Um, so these visual elements uh, include, uh, of course, artist drawings, but also discoverers' maps, surveyors' drawings, prospects of 19th century developments with industrial parks and feats of uh, engineering, uh, a vast photographic archive of the suburban neighborhood and surrounding landscapes, and so on. All these with a distinctly retro-futuristic touch or quality, which I thought was appropriate um, if we wanted to transpose a glow scap in the 1960s or 1970s of Glenn Gould. So Bublex was totally for it, and he very naturally welcomed uh, my last fictional concert, Gould's last fictional concert, or fictional last concert, uh, rather, uh, in his uh, virtual city, in his virtual world. Um, and he designed everything to that effect, including let me share again, including, um, well, the poster. So that was the the uh, initial program for that concert, scheduled, so no date provided, no year provided on, on, on August 29th uh, in Gloscap uh, as part of the Bobac, the Bocabac um, uh, series, uh, festival series. And the first piece that was to be performed was Svelling's amazing piece, Fantasia Contraria, which, which Gould uh, historical, historically performed two times and was at least recorded two times. Um, and it's quite difficult to find the recordings now, today. You have to, 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 to go for the older versions of the, uh, of the records. But uh, you, you'll find some of them, some of them on YouTube. I, I recommend listening to them. So what happens, um, and here it's of course a, a spoiler, I don't think it's really detrimental, since most of you won't get to read the, the novel, I suppose. Um, the spoiler is, is that, well, the performance of that last concert comes in a kind of Cajun uh, way, um, because the way, the way uh, this abrupt and unpremeditated farewell to the public is performed is not by way of offering a last you know goodbye performance as Gould actually did in 1964 in LA 
but by bowing out right after basically not playing the first piece on the program. So I, 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 I describe, um, I describe uh, Gould showing up on stage to perform this involuntary uh, silent piece, which is directly reminiscent of Cage's four minutes, 33 seconds. A, a silent piece. And then, of course, what is the core of the narrative beyond this event, which is uh, reported in a very condensed and brief way? Um, what, what is the, the, the core of the narrative is, is the, you might say, the subjective aftershock uh, of this, uh, this uh, silent performance. And the, the way I introduce the, 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 the performance as a vanishing point is that I place it at the very end of, my, of the narration. Um, so that, in fact, the narration works backwards in time. It's a regressive and it's entirely linear, if you like, despite the, uh, the, 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 the insertions, the inserts of, uh, of remembrances and, and, and biographical anecdotes, the, 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 narrative, the main thread of the narration runs linearly backwards towards this uh, catastrophic concert performance from which, um, from which um, uh, Gould is, is returning, driving his car back to Toronto. So that's the main argument. And I'll, I'll try to wrap up my presentation of, of this narrative attempt not sure it's entirely uh, successful as, as a novel, but it, it works for me as a narrative uh, experiment with uh, Gould's ideas. The way I re will wrap it up is by showing you or giving you a sense of how these uh, various threads I have, uh, I have, uh, I have uh, uh, discussed uh, come together in a way uh, in the context, in the, the very confined and narrow setting of the of the Lincoln Continental for Gould, um, so I have to to deal with the the clock too. I, I don't want it to go over nine p.m. We decided upon a less than 60, 60 minutes format. And so I, I, will, I will come directly to the first point, which I think is obvious from everything I've said so far, which is that the car uh, is not exactly an extension of the studio, which it is, of course, but I think more importantly, the car becomes, in fact, a studio of its own. Um, it performs the very same uh, function. It fulfills the very same function as the studio which is, well, not so much to allow recordings, but also to allow for a, a certain quality of listening to music. The car is a, a studio in, in its own right, because as, 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 as uh, um, uh, Kevin Badzana, who is a wondrous, strange biography of Glenn Gould, I strongly recommend, but pro probably even more so, his uh, very detailed and analytic uh, reading of Glenn Gould's performer work. Um, uh, this is how Balzana puts it. I quote, Even alone, Gould would become wrapped up in music on the radio, singing and conducting, and sometimes kept the score open by his side. He often drove with his legs crossed, with his left foot working the pedals, sometimes with one finger on the wheel at high speeds, regardless of the visibility of the road uh, or the road conditions, always with the windows and vents closed and the heater turned up. The only good thing about his driving was that he did not tailgate. He was afraid of, afraid of inhaling fumes from other vehicles. Um, so this is somewhat anecdotal, but it gives you the, the, the atmosphere. Now, what is more interesting to me, of course, is that the car driving experience is, um, by definition, if you're equipped with a radio or even better, um, a, 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 uh, how, how do you say, a tape tape player? That's not the right expression. It's, it's become so, so outdated now that I, I don't even recall how it's, it was called well. Uh, a device that allows you to play tapes. <laughs> um, 
so anyways uh car the car driving experience uh, is also of course if you're well equipped an active experiment with the prospects of turning the listener himself into a creative performer um, performance continued by other means so you may have heard of, of, of Glenn Gould's fantasizing over what he fancied as a, as, as a, as a listener's kit, audio kit, which would allow the, the performer to actually recompose the work. Um, he kind of anticipated uh, what is now available on every desktop. And he summed up the idea by uh, saying that dial twiddling could itself become an interpretative act and was already one even in one's, uh, in one's car, enabling the listener to become both a composer and a performer. So it's not, about, it's not only about the quality of quasi-tactile proximity and the kind of immersive quality of the bubble uh, uh, provided by the car as a, as a screen shielding uh, the listener from the outside, from the, the rumor of the, of, the, of the wide world. Um, uh, it's it's also the, the the car itself and 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 the very limitations of the device of the uh, audio device and the the constraints um, uh, rep that, that that come with uh, all the distracting factors of driving a car and trying to listen to music and the, the sound of the motor uh, the surrounding um, uh, traffic and so on and so forth all this in fact provides exactly what is needed namely a set a series of, of screens, not only the overall shield of the car itself, but a series of, ta of, 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 of sensory screens which enable you to subtract from uh, the recording, from the recorded performance, uh, all the surplus, all the extra uh, intimations of musicality that uh, distract you from apprehending what he views as being the core, the structural element of, of, of music. And in that sense, of course, his daily experience and, uh, of, of car driving and, and his fondness for long road trips across Canada and sometimes down to New York or even Los Angeles, for that matter, is a directly parallels what um, I spend some time uh, retelling once again, namely what I take to be the foundational experience of the vacuum cleaner. I want to end on this because this is also where the Cajun thread I've alluded to several times comes in, the silence piece. Um, and the paradox here, there are many other paradoxes, but that's one I, which is very, in my view, very graphic, very, very conspicuous. The paradox here is that sound, of course, and Cage would have subscribed to this, sound or noise, if you like, uh, does perform um, the same kind of uh, subtractive operation uh, than silence itself. In fact, it's a way of introducing silence or silencing whatever is, um, uh, is, is, is perceived by Gould as superfluous and unnecessary in, uh, in the, the material conditions of the performance. Um, here uh, I can be content with quoting once again um, from Gould. So Gould has uh, recounted this episode several times. Uh, he's about 13, 12 or 13 years old in his living room practicing, okay? Sitting at the piano, at the keyboard and practicing. What? Well, it happens to be a Mozart piece. Uh, the K394 uh, fugue in C. I quote, It's a wonderful academic study in how to write a fugue. I was learning it when I was an early teenager. Suddenly, one day, a vacuum cleaner was started up beside the piano. So I think his mother or maybe the maid, someone actually uh, turned on, a, a, I, I guess, a very loud vacuum cleaner. You, we are back in the 40s and it must have been very loud. Um, I couldn't hear myself play. I was having a feud with the housekeeper, so clearly it's the, the housekeeper, at this particular time, and it was done on purpose. I couldn't quite hear myself, 
But I began to feel what I was doing, the tactile presence of that fugue as represented by finger positions, and as represented also by the kind of sound you might get if you stood in the shower and shook your head with water coming out of both ears. And it was the most luminously exciting thing you can imagine, the most glorious sound. It took off. Uh, I take this to mean that the piece, the, 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 the fugue, Mozart's fugue, took off. All of the things Mozart couldn't quite manage to do, I was doing for him. And I suddenly realized that the particular screen through which I was viewing this, and which I had erected between myself and Mozart and his fugue, was exactly what I needed, exactly why, as I later understood, a certain mechanical process could indeed come between myself and the work of art that I was involved with. So the deepest, most intense involvement with the work and the kind of mechanistic material conditions for performing the work, coupled with a certain mechanical process, which is described as, a, as, a, as an extension or an assemblage, which is very much part of the performance here, namely the vacuum cleaner being turned on, uh, turned on um, in close proximity with the piano. And the result is uh, a kind of, again, technical transcendence of, of uh, the, 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 the formal structure of the work being erected, being taken off, as, as an airplane, and, and, um, and uh, being presented not strictly to the mental screen, uh, projection screen of, of, of musical imagination, but also, but in a negative way, as, as, as the negative acoustic image and tactile image um, uh, in the form of, well, basically, as, as I understand it, the, the, the bass lines be, being entirely obliterated and silenced by the roaring of the vacuum cleaner. There is a residual image, tactile image, of this silent bass line. Um, and, and this, of course, shows that uh, the body itself uh, is an active medium uh, in the process and that we're not, we're not dealing here with a as, as some, some commentators, overly enthusiastic commentators have described it uh, with a process of and, you know, complete disembodiment, you know, idealization of, uh, of the work through a, a kind of a minimalist, minimalistic performance. It's quite the opposite, in fact. Um, the performance of the fugue or any such uh, textured uh, composition requires an equally textured and articulated construction composition, I would say an organic composition, a vacuum cleaner, purely mechanical external input, coupled with organic bodily sensory motor and kinetic schemes that have been developed over the years by intensive through intensive practice, all this coming together to provide the necessary, uh, I would say the necessary um, conditions for the ideal form, the ideally mute form of the work to take off. And it's an interesting thing because, of course, the vacuum cleaner effect, as you may call it, is structurally homologous with the car driving experience. It's the same thing that happened on a daily basis for Gould. The music being screened, being filtered through um, the assemblage of the body slash car and um, as a result and I'll end on this um, these ideas these musical ideas impressions organic experiences rippling off on different levels uh, in uh, Gould's uh, musical practice and, and theory of practice my last example is about uh, the finger tipping technique I've already mentioned before. Um, I want to show you how concrete the analogy with the car driving experience can be. So this I take again from, from Bazzana's uh, uh, illuminating uh, uh, discussion of, 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 of Gould's technique. It's a passage where he actually spends a good deal of time, uh, I'd say, <laughs> Demythologizing the so-called staccato 
style of Glenn Gould. We can have a discussion about that later. Um, highlighting instead the amount of silence that is required to produce the so-called detached or disjointed uh, articulation of the musical phrase. It's not so much about detaching. It's about making silence uh, an essential part of, uh, of, the, of the process. And in fact, circumscribing each note in a way by a kind of, uh, a kind of thread of silence. And in order to achieve this, because all these are metaphors I'm bringing up, not being a pianist myself, I only have a vague uh, understanding of what is at stake here, but focusing, focusing back on what uh, uh, Gould actually has to say about the way the fingers are involved in the process, I'm struck by the analogy uh, that is uh, presented in the following quote. So I'll end on this. One last idea, one last quote. Um, and um, of course, at that very moment, I've lost <laughs> the reference. So you need to bear with me for a few seconds because I need to get my bearings here. Hmm. Right, not at all the same passage. Here it comes. All right, I had the wrong books. That's, that explains it. So I'm quoting from Bazzana's book on uh, the, the performer in the work. On page 223, I read, so it's, 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 this is, the concluding section of a very, very detailed and, and, and very um, perceptive uh, assessment account of Gould's finger techniques, uh, his articulation and phrasing using this particular tipping technique. Gould often adjusted articulation by analogy with rhythm and dynamics in many cadences where the musical energy diminishes in terms of dynamics and tempo, he also diminishes the articulation. So it's not about detaché style, it's not about staccato, it's about diminishing the articulation, subtracting uh, enough matter uh, in order to reduce the amount of sound relative to silence. So it's a matter of the differential between silence and sound. So we're playing on the verge of inaudibility. That is, Bazana adds, gradually shortening the note values by playing progressively more detaché. So there is a staccato element, but it's not, a, it's not, it's not the staccato that is customarily indicated in certain score, uh, you know, legato, staccato. It's about achieving this particular uh, ratio between silence and sound. And this is where it becomes really interesting for me. As the music grows more restrained and intimate, in other ways, silence increasingly replaces sound. The effect, so this is of course probably more conspicuous in pieces by Webern, where silence is almost an essential ingredient of the composition. But you could hear it also in Bach and the way certain passages are, are actually performed using this technique of, of, of silencing the sound, so to speak. The effect, Bazana writes, might be described as an application of breaks. So you're actually breaking um, just as a, um, uh, you would, uh, in fact, drive your car and achieve this particular relation between speed and braking that allows you to navigate your way through a traffic jam um, or find the proper degree or sound quality or degree of noise that is required for you um, um, that is required from the car to perform its uh, function of a screen enabling the radio piece or, 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 the, or the recording being played to take off. On this uh, I, I want to stop and thank you for your attention I just try to give you a glimpse of a narrative that, uh, of course, I had no ambition to, uh, to, 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 to perform for you.
Um, but uh, I suppose I try to give you an idea of the way I approach uh, the challenge and some of the techniques I put to work to, well, uh, write what happens to be my first uh, fictional piece. Not sure there will be others, but that was fun to do. Thank you. Ellie, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the film too. Right. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm going to, we have two questions on the, in the, in the Q and A. I, I'm going to, just to give you a moment to sort of ease into that uh, mode. Right. I, I want to ask you a question uh, myself. You started with these uh, immensely evocative images of the, uh, well, related to the idea of the North, the snow field, the frozen right. landscapes and so forth as the backdrop for uh, listening to uh, Beethoven. And, and then as you proceeded, that, that, uh, it, it became more enclosed within the screens of the, uh, of the car and, uh, you know, in that studio. But I was very struck um, by the, still the, the presence of that, that backdrop, that, that gray, that icy solitude and so forth. Um, and I kept thinking of Malame as, a, mm. uh, as, as you were speaking. Um, I was thinking precisely of um, the way he talks about uh, un coup de dé, um, mm. and the way that gets articulated in the space uh, uh, as he, you know, as he, as he performs it, so to speak, you know, and spacing it out. And, 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 and the famous preface, he talks about the way in which this spacing, by this spacing, he says, les blancs assume l'importance, right? The, 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 the whites or the blanks, mm. which are initially sort of are figured by the space of the page, start to take on increasing importance. And, and as you were finishing, I was really hearing that, you know, about, about the, the silence coming to mark the, 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 the sort of the, um, mark the notes and the, and the, you know, the staccato quality of the notes and so forth. And I, you know, I, and I, and I was just thinking about I could today. I was thinking about the naufrage, you know, and, and so mm. forth, and the catastrophe. And um, I just wondered if, uh, if, if you, you, if there was any, any that that um, prompted in you any link, because in some sense, your this, this, this backdrop faded away a bit in your talk. Yeah, and I, I just wondered if. Um, yeah, because it's it's a, as I said, it's it it started as an image. And I have a hard time elaborating on it theoretically. I mean, is in a conversation. Um, I, I've tried to I try to perform it narratively by describing certain landscapes in the book, but I'm not very good at conveying this in in um, in in in, in um, yeah in, in prose, as Mallarmé would put it. Nevertheless, I mean, the analogy, of course, is, is essential. I mean, it, it's, it's a structure and an analogy, and it goes beyond, of course, the kind of uh, geographical, topographical settings of northern Canada. It, it has to do essentially something to do with the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, amplitude and, and spacing that is required for um, the creative act to, to, to happen, mm -hmm. to take place. And of course, Mallarmé's whiteness um, the coup de day and then and, 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 and the, 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 the reflection on the way words and ideas are work in fact as constellations on, on, the, on, on the whiteness of the paper is is a is, is very is a very good one and and I think if, if I, I don't think Gould ever mentions Mallarmé in that respect at least but he does refer to Anton Webern's punctuation of the musical score in, in ways which are very similar. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a matter of spacing out, of uh, isolating notes by silences and pauses, which are organically connected with the piece and are not simply a, and a kind of a, a, a kind of external um, uh, uh, technique or external uh, um, factor. It's 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 in fact the the probably the main factor. The notes themselves take on their value by the process, the kind of invisible or silent process of their spacing out, and that is the way Gould described it. He, he describes it as a as a Webern's textures as as um, as um, possessing this sense of mystery, which comes from sound being entirely framed by silence. Um, and of course, what he has in, in, in mind, what he describes is the 
the way the melodic delineation uh, comes in the form, literally on the score, of a diagram of alternating patches of black and white. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you might say this is the case with all scores. Mm -hmm. But in Webern, it takes on a, a, a poetic uh, meaning um, uh, that is, of course, uh, I think, reminiscent of Malarme's uh, uh, coup de day in, in some sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he ends his preface by saying, if you read this out loud, you will realize a score. Right, there you go. Well, thank you. Um, there are questions in the, um, in the question sure. and answer. Um, oh, yeah. Know? So I, I well, have to do some reading. Is that well, it? I'll do a little bit of reading. Um, the first one is uh, <laughs> long. Maybe uh, you can skip through some of the references. But um, uh, the um, Nathan Filbert, uh, um, one of our uh community um i think he, he summarizes a bit near the end if you want to try to pick that up um quickly okay so let me unshare my screen so the the, the last the last question no that's by alan first one is by nathan on the top uh, okay no wait i has ever no need to address my response <laughs> i don't have make opportunities just sharing for no that's not the question where's the question i i it would be the first you have to scroll up i think uh i don't have it maybe i was i was not part of the 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 only question i have which looks like a question is one that started with cage's silence piece and that's not the one you're referring to yeah, yeah, you're looking at that. you need to look at the q a thing that is uh, ah sorry uh, i was in the, ch the general chat sorry okay um oh so so nathan's question right yes that's the person I've also been recently taken up with this via the oral filmic forms. And there's a few references to uh, recent films, Silence Before Bach, Bo Burnham's Inside, and the Dear 30, yes, the 32 short films about Glenn Gould, which I mentioned, uh, Retirement, Teledistance. Um, so is it Kitlerian, sort of? Uh, this is kind of a telegraphic style. I have a hard time. Let me. <laughs> um, world the segmentation, reductive parts versus holes. Succinctly, okay. Relations of techne to sonar con consciousness. I like the, the idea. Sonar consciousness, confinement to creativity, possible careers of musical material related in slash to slash with time and material. Well, there's many things here. I mean, there's many ideas and strands packed in one single question. I'm not sure where to take it from. Um, you, so I'm, I'm just, you mentioned Kittler. Of course, Kittler is not on the radar for Gould, for obvious historical reasons. But Marshall McLuhan is very much present, um, as well as some other Canadian figures reflecting on technology and the, the, the possibility of using technology or turning technology against itself to achieve that kind of transcendence or um, uh, uh, tr uh, trans uh, technical transcendence, uh, as he calls it, which uh, is the proper definition of ecstasy. So it's not about going beyond techniques, it's about turning techniques uh, again, techne against itself in order to, well, to, to break the the, the 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 functionalized and coded and 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 and, uh, and more or less conventional way that uh, techne is generally put to work in music as part of a general organon including of course the instrument but also writing uh, uh, or symbolic uh, uh, techniques of various sorts uh, and and using this reassembling this uh, technical elements in order to, well, basically build a machine. I called it assemblage, and this is the uh, actually what struck uh, people like Deleuze and Gattari uh, when they briefly referred to Glenn Gould in A Thousand Plateau, saying playing in fact Glenn Gould against Cage, saying that well, Cage, Cage's use of chance is is an interesting idea, but it ends up jumbling all the lines and creating a kind of fuzzy, you know, uh, result, something that you cannot really work with, something that is, in the end, um, a kind of allegorical staging of what is already going on out there, which is the, 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 
the rumor of life and, 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 and the real world. Whereas Gould, they say, manages to build a very strange inorganic machine isolating the lines and uh, in a contrapuntal fashion and achieving something which in fact goes in fact beyond music in the strict sense and which connects which manages to connect in a much more efficient way with the cosmic uh, the cosmic um, becomings which of course has always been uh, the, the the main issue uh, in music like connecting our little s singing our little tunes with the cosmic tunes being played out out there so cage and gould try to do that in their own way but the one that achieves this is gould not cage according to them and it has to do with his particular take on te techne or techniques uh, cage has a very classical uh, kind of late thorough-esque uh, relation with technique um, I think he uses it in a rather limited way as a, a, a possible potential purveyor of noise or randomness, um, the chance operations. Whereas Gould tried to extract from it something unheard of, which is an inorganic machine playing music beyond uh, the instrumental uh, limitations of the musical tradition. So. That is the way I would connect to the wealth of references that you introduce in your question. And so, <laughs> so, do you see Gould's writing and radio work to be in dialogue with his contemporaries of the so-called Toronto School? Oh, there you go, MacLuhan. Yes, of course. And this is explicit in in this is explicit in uh, in Gould. So I don't, I'm not sure about Carpenter and, and Havelock. Um, I'm not that familiar with the context, um, so you'd have to ask a ghoul expert. What, uh, Catherine, uh, what was your exploration of Gould? What has, sorry, your exploration of Gould revealed regarding time? How does music's manipulation of tempo, rhythms, etc. transform the experience of time and perhaps transform time itself? Yeah, that's an interesting question, which uh, resonates with some of the seminars we had at EGS a few years ago. So that may be a, actually a, a reminiscence of that. Um, well, um, what strikes me, uh, in, to put a long story short, in the way, specifically the way, um, the way um, Gould approaches the, f the fugue form, the fugal form. He's reflected, he's reflected extensively on the fugal form, of course performed it in so many ways. But the one striking element that I retain is that the general aesthetics and, and poetics of Gould, as, as you may have realized, is, is formalist or idealistic in the sense that it aims as, as quickly, as directly as possible um, at the structural core of a musical composition. And when you say structure, of course, the sense is that it, 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 it is, in a sense, atemporal. It, it is, does not abide by um, uh, the linear time of uh, the actual unfolding of the piece in, 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 in the way it's performed, you know, sort of f from one instant to the next, uh, according to uh, a kind of Bergsonian scheme of the melody unfolding continuously uh, and at the same time retaining um, uh, as a thread, all the uh, the past moments, which uh, are in a sense still resonating, still present uh, in in the in the in the now. So when you think structure, you think of something which is almost entirely severed from this type of conception of musical performance as an ongoing unfolding. Um, you think of structure as a almost spatial, entirely spatial. A set of relations between elements which entertain uh, various kind of uh, structural uh, uh, levels of articulation. And of course, in a sense, uh, um, Gould is very much attached to that conception of musical form. Um, I refer to Hanslick, but he himself refers to more modern and contemporary musical theorists. And he, he feels a strong affinity with a kind of detemporalized 
you know, view of, of music. Um, on the other hand, the way he invested, intensively invested the fugal form shows something different, which is a, a, a and, and the con more generally the contrapuntal techniques, the contrapuntal um, structures. Uh, it sort of reintroduces a sense of the linear unfolding of parallel musical phrases or musical lines uh, in a way that cannot entirely dispense with the kind of Bergsonian intuition of things happening um, in real time, de proche en proche in French, uh, according to local relations of connection. So things have to unfold in a linear fashion. Um, the, 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 and, and this is also, by the way, what Deleuze and Gattari, which I mentioned, whom I mentioned earlier in Thousand Plateaus, uh, find so interesting in Glenn Gould, is the way he he manages to ha have the, the musical lines proliferate uh, sort of independently from each other at various levels, and yet uh, producing the overall sense of an organic unity, which ideally could or should be unfolded in, in, a, in a purely uh, almost geometrical sense, atemporally. is this combination of the linearity of performance and the structural uh, the structural um, conspicuousness of of, uh, of, um, of the structural uh, articulations, which I think is uh, is so important and, and so remarkable about the fugal form. Um, so, what we end up with is a is, is a form of time or a temporal form, which is which is uh, rather unstable, but standing in, so to speak halfway between uh, stru the structuralist view of of, of um, of form being sort of uh, entirely spatial, essentially spatial in nature, and the more Bergsonian, the more linear uh, view of uh, of uh, a performance that kind of uh, is adherent to uh, the um, its 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 own temporality, whose tempor temporality is not only a way of uh, actualizing or playing out the structure, but whose that, that, that is an, an active ingredient of the structure itself. Um, so I guess that is where, um, that is the place where, uh, the critical uh, place where Gould would have something to contribute to a reflection on, on musical time, if you like. So in order to be more specific, we'd have to pick up an example. I mean, it's, it's a, I've, so far, I've been dealing with musical ideas without playing music at all, and with with very remote references to actual pieces. But uh, we'd have to implement it at some point. So I don't think this is the proper setting, though. Oh, should we go on? Um, so there's something about Cage's silent piece. Before that, there's something about. Uh, the environment in which the music is played, yes. Do you think this could also have been a way Gould would answer back to his critics, or not so, to those critics who were not so impressed with certain interpretation made by Gould? Yeah. Um, interesting. So no, I've I've never thought of uh, of of providing an answer to my to Gould's critics that would involve directing them back at the circumstances or the environment in which they do listen to Gould, if they still do. Um, maybe I should try it in your car, you know, uh, drop the earphones and do something else. I'm not sure. Uh, that could be an interesting uh, prospect. Alan, uh, Cage's silence piece, subtractive screen, Gould's mental states and heavy prescription drug use. Yes, that's an element I tried not to mention, but uh, there it is. If Gould is the Deleuzean guitarian schizo on a walk on various antipsychotic medications, how does this connect to your style, my style, as antipsychotic, seemingly reasonable narrator? Is this an intentionally anti Gouldian gesture? Um, yeah, I'm not comfortable with applying the schizo category to to Gould himself, uh, to, to Gould's persona. So there is an element of split personality. He, he had so many avatars, 
uh, representing himself uh, uh, in in various contexts, various interviews, so uh, a host of, of of persona, including the the German music teacher, uh, the 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 Bostonian academic, and so on and so forth, which is a playful way of of, of introducing the many voices and the kind of uh, self-taught uh, poly polyphonic writer that he is to the general public. So he played, I mean, he always uh, dealt with the serious topics at, at, the, at the edge of his own ignorance. He was very uh, aware of his own limitations as a, as a public speaker and a self-taught academic. Um, he never held an academic positions, but he did write contributions which could be, you know, viewed as a contribution kind of musicology uh, in, in a way. Um, and the way he dealt with that was to introduce a level of, of randomness or, or uh, a level of also playfulness and, and, um, and theater in the, in the way he's, he conveyed his ideas. Um, and so making like abrupt and, and somewhat uh, unexpected connections between various strands of contemporary culture, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. But I wouldn't describe this as a, as a schizo. I mean, it's, it's just a, it's just a, the way he, he, he worked his way through uh, contemporary uh, musical culture uh, and theory. Um, I don't, so I don't see how he's, yeah, he's heavy, he's kind of a hypochondriac, but also uh, addictive, um, self-prescribed medication comes into play. I'm not sure how relevant it is to to his musical ideas. To a large extent, I would say it's not uh, entirely relevant. I mean, not not any more than, than Mick Jagger's uh, past addiction is relevant to his music. Or you'd have to say that every every great musician is, is a schizo or every rock and roll band is, is made of uh, X or present active junkies. I mean, I'm not sure it helps a lot. Um, I'm sorry for to be I, I, I don't want to um, uh, impose too much. I don't know how, how your strength is going. Please um, take a bit more if you'd like. There's an Maybe the last one, the, the so-called paradox. Yeah. Um, so please go ahead with your um, what, how you prefer. OK, so it's the last one that shows up on my screen. Oh, no, there's a couple of other ones. OK, let me pick up. The so-called paradox of instrumentation, so I called it the principle of uh, musical indifference, uh, is one that's been picked up in contemporary music with a number of different theses being tossed about. Okay, One is the extension of the timbral reduction of the Webern nono Boulez lineage, yes, which takes instruments to be materially equal, but which therefore directly thematizes the specificity of instrumental timbers and often the surprising non-congruity of those instruments in typical orchestrational settings. Another is the contemporary neo-romanticism of instruments, which preserves the specificity of instrumentality, even though it may, it may push a given instrument to an extended domain, not only extended techniques, a term hated by composers, okay, I was not aware of that, but also to a performance practice that is itself centered around an extended center, a composer of this kind might be Andrew Greenwald. Okay, I w w reading you, I had in mind the kind of spectralist uh, factions in France and elsewhere, which were a kind of uh, introduced a, a different approach to timber and, and to the these instrumental qualities. Um, all right. Um, yes, so let's get to the question. Paradoxically, if there is a contemporary equivalent of Gould, perhaps it is Eric Wobbles, whose kinesthetics of sound seem to repeat Gould's gesture most radically. So I'm not familiar with Wobbles, I have to check him out. In, instead of returning pianos to mean tone, tem mean tone temperament, however, he uses heterophonic unison to put in contrast the kinesthetic rather than timbral incongruity of instruments that may be perfectly well orchestrated and so on and so forth. Yeah, you mentioned Lachenmann earlier, which could be a re an interesting reference too, yes. Nevertheless, now comes the question, is Gould's decentering of performance practice only possible with canonical repertoire? Or is there room for composition or with around the instrumental paradox? I guess you're uh, absolutely right. This is very, a very good way of 
m mapping the some contemporary options or differences in, in the landscape. So uh, I guess all these people, all, all the trends and people you mentioned do struggle with the paradox I mentioned. And it's true that Gould himself, uh, being interested as he, he was in a certain type of repertoire, didn't go very far in the, in the way of abstracting from the piano in the end. So he provided, I would say, different projects and possible projections of what an extended practice of the piano could mean. Abstractions of, of the piano rather than abstracting from the piano. Um, intimations of a more abstract level at which the piano could be put to work, including listening to the radio while playing the piano, of course. Um, uh, and this is... Uh, 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 one way to go and of course uh, it would connect with certain experiments in contemporary music including some of Cage's own experiments with radio players or radio transistors but as far as uh, the more uh, sophisticated examples you provide are concerned I, I'm, I'm not sure I, I, at some point the paradox uh, becomes too general uh, if it covers so much ground I mean from from the uh, from uh, no no to uh, wobbles, I think um, we're losing something of the edge of Gould's uh, contribution, which was in the narrow confines of classical music or classical and early contemporary music to uh, provide a striking uh, uh, examples of the way you could, in fact, without entirely leaving the stage, without entirely giving up the piano. Um, provided with extensions which kind of commu secretly or not so secretly communicated with other strands of contemporary culture, in including pop music, which I think he was more familiar with than uh, the, the, the more edgy uh, composer. I mean, of course, he knew, he, he knew about Stockhausen and, and the like, but uh, what he listened to was uh, um, Petula Clark, basically. Uh, um, uh, and he hated the Beatles. For, uh, despite the wealth of uh, musical experimentation and studio work that that they introduced in in pop music, he hated them for essentially melodic reasons. <laughs> um, anyways, my point is that I think the the paradox is is active if we use it in a more restrained, more framed way. Um, is 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 this because myself I'm, I'm not I'm not yielding to the schizo drive that I'm myself. Uh, uh, as was said in the previous question, an anti guldian in that respect, an anti-neurotic. <laughs> I, I don't know, but I think um, I think paradoxes and, and 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 not only musical ideas, but ideas in general work better if we don't stretch them too far. So you might say I've I've been doing that from the start, stretching the idea the idea of the piano or the idea of musical performance to the very the the, the sheer act of listening to to your radio as you're driving your car. Isn't that stretching an idea? Well, it is, yes, but it is from the perspective which is very narrow, as you pointed out, uh, which concerns a particular setting, a particular tradition, uh, a particular set of conventions associated with a type of repertoire, and um, uh, namely, uh, mostly classical music, as we say. And and, and I think that's where it, it retains its, um, its strength and, and, and its importance. If you stretch it to cover everything there is to be said about contemporary music and its involvement with instruments and the, the material condition of sound, of musical sound, I think you lose the, the edge, you lose something. I have a hard time pinpointing it, but I think there's here a, it's another paradox or maybe a, a law of, um, of inverse ratio between the degree uh, the productivity of an idea that you can stretch very far, as Gould does, and the narrowness of its original perspective, the original problem that um, Gould is dealing with is how to play Bach or Mozart on the piano and not being trapped or uh, prisoner of uh, the the overall and the kind of uh, uh, alienating structure of um, the musical tradition. So 
I would not go as far as you do because uh, although it, I find it very interesting the way you you describe things, but um, I would recommend using Google soberly. Um, in the description of this presentation, you write sitting in the back seats are Lyotard, Deleuze and Adorno. Yes, but like ch young children or teenagers, they're sleeping. Uh, <laughs> they're, dozing, they've, they're dozing off and then and maybe listening to the gently listening to the music. They don't have much to contribute explicitly. Uh, but it's, 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 it has been very much there at the back of my mind uh, when preparing this, 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 this work of fiction. And, and, and it is explicitly uh, uh, there in the original, the seminal paper I mentioned published in 2000 about Cage and Gould, where I sort of use also to mention only Lyotard, which haven't, hasn't been mentioned so far. I, I, I use a piece by Lyotard uh, called Plusieurs Silences which is about contemporary music, about Nono, about Berio, about Stockhausen, and dealing with a kind of um, a pulsional, a libidinal economy of contemporary music and, and its involvement with the material, the material um, parameters of sound. Um, and there, I, 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 the, the way uh, Lyotard introduces the notion of the, theat the theatrical um, the theatrical um, reference to the stage, the screens, and the various levels of, of, of uh, perspectival depth that comes with the classical vision of uh, musical form. The way he plays with this um, and tries to bring it elsewhere by allowing the libidinal sonic uh, uh, drive to diffuse in the theater of representation of classical music is very interesting because it doesn't amount to simply giving up the stage, giving up the screens and the perspectival uh, constructions uh, of, of uh, musical depth or perspective. It, it, it's it's a, a different story which involves, essentially involves a different way of relating sound to silence, ultimately. So the piece is called Several Silences, Plusieurs Silences. And I found it very relevant myself to deal with uh, issues uh, pertaining to Gould and Cage. I can't really uh, give you the, the general argument, but this is the way I, I, I approach it. Thanks, Chris Ellie. Loving the idea of the cross fertilization of Malarmé. Yes, sure. Yes, and Cage's collection, collected writings, uh, Silence, um, is of course a uh, an important reference here. I think it's, yeah, it's, it's, it, it has to be, I don't have it here physically, but it is the, uh, the book you need to have, uh, to, to place in your, on your library shelf, very close in close proximity with, uh, the Glenn Gould reader. Um, on this, I, I mean, we could go on and on I mean, <laughs> spend the entire evening, but let, let me, um, I rescue you. It's um, Shabbat. <laughs> Time for silence. Um, uh, uh, but let me point out to everyone that Ellie will be conducting a seminar this summer. A seminar this summer in the EGS session. Um, I can't remember the dates, so everyone should go look at the schedule and uh, be further tempted. A beautiful partition there of uh, partition there of uh, a score of, of seminars, and uh, we'll look forward to. Having you back then, Ellie. Um, thank you so much. That was beautiful. Uh, Thanks a lot, and, uh, everyone. And hopefully, you'll get to read the novel if if someone translates it into English. It's not going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So I wish you a happy day for the remaining remaining hours. And for me, it's already quite dark. It's not exactly the idea of North, but it's already pretty gray. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Take good care of yourself. Farewell. Bye. 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 <laughs>